Um, and I'm very glad to introduce Jane. I this is her third time talking to the Garden Club, but it's I haven't heard. But it was before my time, so I haven't heard her talking to the Garden Club. But I've had the pleasure of hearing her and seeing her wonderful pictures in other venues. So I'm just delighted that that she's here talking to us today. Jane earned her a master's degree in botany from the University of Washington in 1994. Um, during that time, she conducted four years of demographic work on golden paintbrush, um, and which some of us, us might have in our gardens because it was available at one point, uh, um, I think, during the native garden plant sale. She has worked for the Washington National Natural Heritage Program, conducting field surveys and preparing conservation reports. She's created and managed the no King County Noxious Weed Control Program, and prepared a noxious weed management plan for San Juan County. She is a life member of the Washington Native Plant Society and a long ago vice president of the Washington Native Plant Society board. She moved to San Juan Island in 2011. She served as local WNPS chapter chair. She completed master gardener training in 2013 and coordinated the San Juan County Master Gardener Foundation's annual plant sale for several years. And I know the class that's coming up in the Master Gardeners is going to benefit from this. She teaches the native plants class for the Master Gardener training program, and she enjoys gardening and loves to explore the islands with her husband, Keith. So, Jaina, welcome. We're so glad you're here. Thank you for that introduction, Lainey. Um, it's um, it's always good to be back here. I wanted to um, talk about the adaptability and the resiliency that we all have to be able to switch places. And um, I wanted to mention, I wanted to say thanks to Chris and Lynn for hosting me. And we are recording and Zooming live from their home today. So I'm glad everyone can be home safe and warm and um, I'm happy to be back. As Lainey said, I've done this. This is my third talk to this group, and I've always enjoyed it. You are very curious, and um, you want to learn, and we have lots of fun. Questions and answers are always good. And if you do, if you do have a question during the presentation that um, really needs to be addressed right away, maybe you can alert by raising your hand or something. I often like to... Um, move in that direction if the questions drive it. So don't feel, um, don't don't hesitate to interrupt if you want. And if it's not appropriate, we'll wait until the very end. Um, so anyway, um, so yeah, it's kind of an interesting event that's happening right now with all of this snow. And you can see the beautiful backdrop that I have here in Chris and Lynn's home. And in 2017, I was first there to talk to you about attracting pollinators to the garden with native plants. And then in 2019, we shifted gears and I talked about weeds and wildflowers, invasive species. And that was also a very lively discussion. And today we're back to native plants in the garden with a focus on how our gardens can support pollinators and increase biodiversity. And as a plant person, it was interesting. I live on San Juan Island, and I don't know if you read the San Juan Journal, but there was a good front page cover story of the um, the um, Garden Club's presentation and featuring me, and they misspelled my name, which is not uncommon for the San Juan Journal, <laughs> but they spelled my name went wart without an H at the end. And it was interesting because the term wart, W-O-R-T, refers to plant. And it often means like a medicinal plant or an herbaceous plant. So I think I'm gonna send them a little note thanking them for giving me my botanical name that I can use in the future, went wart. So it's kind of a interesting little serendipity there. I, um, I very much enjoy seeking out new information about native plants and gardens. And I recently discovered this new book, relatively new book, it's the Pacific North, the, the Pacific Native Plant Primer or Primer by Kristen Curran and Andrew Merritt. And they are a couple that own a nursery called Humble Roots down in the Columbia River Valley. 
And it caught my eye. I was reading a review of it in a Native Plant Society publication. I immediately bought it in you know late December, and I've been just going through it like crazy. It's a lovely, lovely book, and I highly recommend it. It is really... Um, spoken to me in a lot of ways on this topic that we're going to be talking about. And I'm always inspired by new and old authors um, and scientists like Doug Tallamy. They really give me a lot of um, compelling reasons to rethink how I'm gardening and how our gardens can be more useful. So I'm going to share my screen, which is something I should have done. And here we go. And um, let's see. Okay. Just showing you some photographs that are um, the, the upper right and the bottom left photos are actually my garden, which is new to this presentation. I have enough things to show you now in my own garden and it's kind of exciting. I like that. Okay, so um, these are just a few um, indications of just the beauty that we can attract in our gardens. And you'll be seeing these slides again, so I will leave with that. Um, so actually, I'm going to back up here because I do want to say something about this. Um, in, in thinking about how we attract pollinators, it's a really, I think it's a bigger goal is to support wildlife, attract pollinators, and reduce maintenance. And that's one of the things that I've been working on in my own garden. I believe that our gardens can complement rather than compete with nature. And that is a message that I get over and over and over again in all of the books and presentations that I'm following. And it's a very strong and compelling message. Our, our, our islands here, this archipelago of islands is blessed with a wide variety of habitats. And whether we're talking about coastal habitats, which include the sandy beaches, rocky headlands, tidal marshes, and coastal forests, or aquatic habitats like freshwater ponds, lakes, streams, and wetlands, west side forests and lowland mixed forests, these are characterized by mixes of coniferous firs and deciduous trees like big leaf maple and Douglas maple vine maple, alder, understory of ferns, shrubs, and forbs, which are non-grass-like herbaceous plants. These, these habitats require ample seasonal rainfall to thrive. Unlike the forests that we see in eastern Washington, which are much drier, they're more dominated by things like ponderosa pine. We've got our Douglas fir, our western red cedar, our hemlock, those kinds of things here on the, on the west side. We also have meadows and grasslands and prairies. These are sunny open areas with a minimal amount of woody growth and perennial bunch grasses and flowering plants. Many of these habitats are converted to agricultural land. Our oak woodland and savannas, um, is a, it's a fairly unique habitat and we happen to be blessed with them here. Quercus gariana, or Oregon white oak, is our only native oak here in Washington. And it occurs in some of the Pacific Northwest's most threatened habitats. Savannas are grasslands with oaks scattered among fields of wildflowers and grasses that support numerous species of wildlife. Um, our oaks have a, a thing called masting. And last year in 2023, we had a mast year for oaks actually across the North American continent. And masting is when oaks produce copious amounts of acorns. And I'm not really sure why, um, it's kind of a cyclical thing, but in 2023 here in the Northwest, our oaks, like they went off the charts in the number of acorns that they were producing. And as a result, my friend, Doug McCutcheon, who works for the land bank, he and I sat down and talked about an idea that I helped to bring to fruition and we called it the Future Forests Project. And Doug and I, with the help of several other volunteers, um, um, we identified several of the land bank preserves and areas that were suitable for planting acorns. And then we called on a number of landowners who donated and collected and donated. They 
buckets full, five gallon buckets full, wheelbarrows full of acorns. And all told over a period of about 12 weeks with all the volunteers here on San Juan, we um, planted over 6,000 acorns. And it's a lot easier to plant an acorn than it is a seedling. So you can just imagine we got quite proficient at digging in maybe an inch down, popping in an acorn, moving on, moving on, moving on. It was really fun. It was a good way to get to see some of the preserves that aren't necessarily open to the public and some beautiful, beautiful habitats, which of course, given how, how slowly oaks grow, we're not likely to see in my lifetime for sure. But that, the point was that they are future forests. We are trying to um, disperse enough acorns that hopefully some of them will survive. It was a really, really fun project. Lainey, I was gonna ask if you could check the chat for me and see if there's anything I need to know. I'm doing that. Okay, thank and you. I, and uh, you, you have a very good audience up that you might be interested in knowing now. We're up to 50, so. Oh, my okay, yeah, I, just, was I saw a couple pop up on my screen and I was just- Yeah, curious. they were giving information to people. So. Okay, excellent, thank you, thank you. Okay. So back to the coast, the uh, different habitats, I think it's a real blessing that we have so many different areas and many of these functional and important habitats are becoming more and more fragmented or lost entirely to development, invasive species, climate change events. So habitat loss is a very real threat to native plant populations of, um, as well as to the many species that depend upon those plants. Insects and wildlife need native plants to survive and directly or indirectly, so do we. Native plants characterize the natural landscape and in our gardens, they can be used to create beautiful perennial beds and pollinator gardens, rain gardens. They can add to our local ecology. So when I started putting this, this um, presentation together, I, I wanted to show you like some of, some or most of my favorites. And when the list began to exceed about 65 species, I decided that in the interest of time, I'd better narrow it down a bit. So I chose maybe about 30. And all of those plants, you'll, you'll, some of them you'll be familiar with. Um, most all of them have some kind of redeeming value in terms of providing food or nectar or attracting pollinators, forage, that kind of thing. So there are a lot of favorite native plants. So let's talk a bit about gardening goals. So everyone has a different goal when they plant a garden. Some are looking to recreate a tiny piece of the open meadows and prairies that we see when we're out and about in these lovely islands. Some want to grow edible plants and as much of their own organic produce as possible. Some view planting as decorating their garden, patio, and porch with attractive, welcoming colors. No matter the goal, many gardeners enjoy lower maintenance plants, those that draw in butterflies, hummingbirds, and other pollinators, and those that require less frequent watering. And many native plants offer these desirable attributes. My own growing interest in attracting and pro providing for pollinators is really about providing a sanctuary for wildlife and insects and other beings in our, guards, in our gardens. And that starts with providing the basic habitat components, food, water, cover, and spaces to raise their young. So we'll start with what is a native plant. Um, in my new favorite book, The Native Plant Primer, Curran and Merritt define it as those plants occurring naturally in the geographic region in which they evolved. They co-evolved with local insects, birds, mammals, and soil microorganisms, and therefore have the ability to support the diversity of life that gives the natural world its beauty and function. I really like that. It's a very complex definition, but it really says it all. And the other definition that I subscribe to is the one through the Washington Native Plant Society that they crafted in 2008. And that says, Washington native plants are those species that occur or occurred within the state boundaries before European settlement based upon the best available scientific and historical documentation. Um, so the definition of native plant is often kind of controversial and disputed, but it's important to keep that in mind when you're looking at what's a native plant versus what may be naturalized and 
looks like it, it's been here forever, but it's important to know the difference because um, I think the key about the native plants is when you're talking about specialists that rely on certain kinds of native plants or native um, fauna, that's really important for them. Whereas our generalist species, they can adapt. They might, they might not notice the difference between you know, a lavender or a Douglas iris, you know, that kind of thing. So it's really important just to get a baseline of what what's native and what's not. Not that the non-native plants don't have a purpose. Um, I like to show this slide, this slide of the ecoregions just because I think when you're thinking of native plants, it's also a very relative thing. So a native plant can be something that occurs only here in the San Juan Islands, very endemic or only in Western Washington, or all of Washington, or all of Washington, Oregon, British Columbia, parts of Northern California. This is kind of different eco-regions. It's all about habitat and how far these plants can actually move on their own, whether they're dispersed by wind or water or animals. So what I like about native plants is that um, we get to observe them in their natural environments. And when we're, using when we're using introduced species, we have to rely on secondary sources. Like if you go to a nursery, for example, and that's what I mean by an introduced species, a non-native species, you have to like read the label and figure out what the habitat requirements are, what the water and sun and you know, fertilizer requirements are. But in nature, we can see what they're doing, where they, where they like to grow in the first place. Um, and, and also when you know that some introduced species can be invasive. So when you're dealing with a native plant, you've got a sure bet that it's not gonna be an invasive species. But they're also better adapted to our local environment, our soils, our moisture, the climate that we have, although climate is changing and, and the adaptability is also changing too. Um, in general, native plants, once established, require less water. They reduce the need for fertilizers and pesticides. They increase the natural biodiversity and support insect and other pollinators. And native birds and native wildlife prefer the native trees and shrubs for food and shelter. That's not to say they won't eat your roses and other yummy things, but given uh, the choice, that's what they evolved with, that's what they know. And I think, um, yeah, like I said, they're less likely to be become invasive. There are a few ex uh, exceptions to that where invasibility is um, a potential issue. But they also give us more choices for our planting palette. And that's one of the things I really like about them. They're beautiful. They do everything that a lot of other cultivated, non-native, non-invasive plants will do in the garden. But it adds to the choices that we have. And when you're talking about supporting native fauna, they're, they're a sure bet to be able to do that. So what do hummingbirds, butterflies, and bees have in common? They all pollinate flowering plants. And you can see a picture of a rufous hummingbird, ceanothus, silk moth, and a bumblebee on a Oregon grape flower. Insects and animals pollinate close to 90% of all plants including more than a third of the crops and foods we eat. That includes fruits, vegetables, grains, nuts, and beans. And in the United States alone, um, we grow more than a hundred crops that either need or benefit from pollinators. That's an important thing to remember. If we don't have pollinators, we don't have crops. And the economic value of insect pollinating crops, this was back in, uh, this is an old slide from 18, 27 billion. I think it's definitely in the tens of billions every year. So the bottom line is it's a very important ec high economic value of these insect pollinated crops and important sources of food for all of us that we, we really rely on. So we, I'd hate to see the pollinators go by the wayside. So many butterfly and bee species have disappeared or are at risk due to habitat loss, diseases, pesticide use. And we can create gardens and landscapes that attract and support pollinators. Native plants provide resources like 
nectar, forage, and, and sufficient habitat for these pollinators and other, other animals that depend on these plants. Yeah, this is a little bit about honeybees. I get questions about this a lot. So there's no hard evidence of the impacts honeybees might have on native bees. And there are so many native bees that they're sort of behind the scenes. But if you really observe them in your garden, you'll notice that there's a lot of different kinds of bees. Honeybees are just one of many, many, many other kinds of bees. But in areas where there's limited forage, the honeybees, because of their numbers and their aggressiveness, because they are social bees, they, um, they might compete. They might outcompete with native pollinators. But otherwise, there's really no hard evidence that the honeybees are having a really bad impact on, pollen on other native bees. But honeybees as crop pollinators, they are the advantage of them is that they can be supplied in large numbers. They're readily transportable. And of course they produce honey, which is also a real advantage. But native bees pollinate far more effectively than honeybees. And native bees forage over a longer period of time. They will often visit flowers in wetter or colder conditions when the honeybees are still hunkering down in their beehives. So the bottom line is that efforts that support native bees will also benefit honeybees. So there's no, you don't really need to worry about that. If you're doing things to support your honeybees, the native bees will come. All those beautiful flowers they'll, they'll forage on and everybody will be happy about it. <laughs> okay, so native plants, as I said, are important for pollinators. They're four times more attractive, more likely to attract native bees. The woody ornamental plants in gardens have been shown to support 14 times as many as introduced species, again, because our native fauna have co-evolved with these ornamental, uh, with these woody shrubs. Um, they increase the abundance of native butterflies and moths. And I was just gonna back up and say something about that. Um, with the increase in the abundance of native, native butterflies and moths, a really important piece of that is that it also supports the larval stages of these native butterflies and moths, not just the adults. And those larval stages are so, so important for our songbirds to be able to feed their young. And I remember a slide from one of Doug Tallamy's presentations where I think he showed like a black cap chickadee or some little chickadee kind of bird. And they, he actually gave out a number of like how many thousands of caterpillars that little baby chickadee needed to eat every day. So remember that about the beetle larvae and the butterfly and moth larvae are really, really an important part of the food chain. Okay. Um, this is a takeoff on if you build it, they will come. I often get questions about um, if I wanted to plant milkweed, what species of milkweed should I plant here? to attract the um, monarch butterfly. And this is a page from the Burke Museum, the Burke Herbarium Image Collection, which is an excellent, accurate online resource for native plants and photographs. It's a, I'll talk about that a little bit later. Um, I looked it up and there are actually five native species of milkweed that all occur, if you can see the map, in Eastern Washington, east of the Cascades. Well, that's where the monarchs also occur. So if any of us decided we wanted to plant a lot of milkweed here in the San Juans or even on the west side, it's not likely that the monarch migration would suddenly shift their, chain, their, their route and find those little patches of milkweed. That's not to say milkweed won't support other, other you know, bees and beetles and wasps and things like that. If you look at the bottom of this slide, the pollination status is bumblebees, bees, butterflies, beetles, and wasps. So other butterflies will be attracted to that, but it'll only be those insects that are already here. So excessive rain events and longer droughts and wildfires and smoke and extreme temperatures as we are seeing this week. Um, I, you know, it's hard to deny that, that climate change is a real and profound threat to people, plants, and wildlife around the globe. 
And planting trees will reduce carbon in the atmosphere. Good idea to plant trees. Um, Dr. Richard Hebda, who's the curator of botany and earth history at the Royal British Columbia Museum, I had asked him one time about planting. What, what can we do to add to our biodiversity? And his, his definitive remark was planting more native plants will add to biodiversity and increase resiliency to changes in rainfall and temperature. And he actually specifically said plant more snowberry because it's not, you know, it's a really easy plant to grow and it has a lot of good good qualities and um, it'll grow in a lot of different environments. <clears throat> Pure species versus cultivars of native species. Um, a cultivar of, native, of a native species is often called a nativar. And um, when you go to the nursery, most of the time, that's what you will see are cultivars of native species, not the true um, straight species. Although they're, they are out there, and especially if you go to a native plant nursery, you're more likely to find the straight species. There are a lot of reasons that cult these cultivars are created, and most of them focus on aesthetics and disease resistance. They're often showier than cultivated species, but the question is, is are these showier species supporting wildlife? And do they help to get us to know and identify plant and plant native species? So there are two reasons that I wouldn't turn to a cultivar, um, a native cultivar as a first choice. First of all, most are propagated clonally, which means there is zero genetic variability. And in this age of climate change, especially, it's important to have a lot of genetic variability in plants so that they can adapt to the swings in climate. So putting plants with no genetic variability, they're all the same because they're a clone, it's not really, really going to make them more adaptable. And the second reason is, is that if the only thing we sell in nurseries are designed for aesthetics only, it, it perpetuates the idea that plants are just decorations. And sometimes plants are cultivated to have different leaf or flower colors than the original plant. And although they may look especially pretty to our eyes, it's, you don't really know if the insect pollinators are as attracted to them. Some of them have less nectar than the original species. So we're not really sure how useful these native ours are to the animals that you're trying to support. So we're gonna go into this section on a variety of different kinds of plants in the garden and the landscape. And I want to just note as I go through the different slides of different plants that pretty much they all are in here because they provide either food or shelter or some kind of habitat, you know, attracting pollinators, providing nectar. They do some or all of those things. And rather than repeat every one of them, um, I'm happy to answer specific questions about that. But I think I'll go through those a little more quickly. Some of them you'll be very familiar with. But um, I'd like to show you now about, I say, maybe 30 of the many native plants that I enjoy, some in my own garden. <clears throat> many of them are found locally here in the San Juans, and some occur in other parts of the state or our region in the Pacific Northwest. And you can find hundreds more from a variety of online resources and books. Um, one of the places that I like to go to is actually the King County website, kingcounty.gov has a number of, has a whole list of native plant nurseries. And I was looking at it just the other day and I was really, really surprised to see that over the years, it used to be really hard to find more than just a handful of native plant nurseries in Washington. And now there's like three pages of them out there. So um, there's a lot of different sources for native plants. And before I get into some of my favorite plants, I wanted to warn you of my penchant to use the scientific botanical name instead of, or in addition to the common names of plants. Now, I often hear from some that they don't like the Latin names or they find them too difficult to remember or to pronounce because yeah, true enough, some foreign languages can be challenging. Um, but for the record, botanical names are derived from several languages and not just Latin. And they are more specific and universally accepted. 
and they often reveal relationships and characteristics of the plants. So they're a little more informative. And one example that I like to use, because I love this name, is our little Calypso orchid. The scientific name is Calypso bulbosa. It has such a nice ring to it. And the bulbosa refers to the shape of the flower because it's a little tiny lady slipper. It's a bulbous flower shape. It also happens to have, and, and the, the, the species or genus name is Calypso, which we call them Calypso orchids. So I also would have you consider the following, Arbutus, Clematis, Dahlia, Daphne, Persithia, Geranium, Magnolia, Ranunculus, Rhododendron. How many do you have a lot of trouble pronouncing those names? We use them for common names, but guess what? Those are the scientific names. So you've already been using them. And there are many more like that. So I think it's a matter of mindset of getting used to hearing, at least hearing those, those scientific names. Anyway, that's my plug on scientific names because I think it's really important. I don't have my book bag with me because it's in the car, but um, there is a book that I would recommend and I'll, I'll, I can send you any of this information later. It's called Portable Latin for Gardeners. It's a little book and it's filled with lots of information about what some of these scientific names were actually refer to. They tell you something about the plant and I find that to be fascinating. Okay, so now we're gonna move on. So I start out with willows because I think like the oaks are in a, lots, very, in a lot of parts of North America, they're known as keystone species. A keystone species is something that many other species rely on, that if it were removed from the ecosystem, it would impact a whole number of other species. And across North America, which many other states have lots of different oaks, Oaks tend to be a keystone species. They support a lot of wildlife. But here we have 36 species of willows and one species of oak in Washington. So I look at willows as a keystone species here in our, in our state. And planting keystone species of any kind will often host large numbers of the Lepidoptera, which are the butterflies and moths. Um, this also includes wild cherries. Those, those kinds of species because they bloom in the spring and those beautiful floral parts, those catkins and all, they provide lots of early season nectar for um, the bees especially. So willows, you know, they're sometimes maligned, but they, they thrive here. We have 36 species and they're all, they're all very hardy. They're just lovely plants. Pacific crabapple is another favorite and um, this, um, the flowers attract the pollinators and the fruits are edible. They are eaten by several animals, including many birds, and it's an excellent cover for wildlife and it gives you some nice fall color. Um, Pacific madrone, which is always a strikingly beautiful tree, um, evergreen and that bark is just, yeah, there's nothing like it. Arbutus menziesii. Um, those white flowers, like others in that family, um, really attract hummingbirds and butterflies and bees and the fruits in the fall are eaten by robins and flippers and waxwings and even western bluebirds. So we've got our two shorter, um, smaller growing maples, the Rocky Mountain or the Douglas maple, Acer glabrum, and the vine maple, which is Acer cercinatum. Both have a place in our gardens and yards. And the thing about the... Um, the Acer glabrum is that it, it really occurs here in the, in the San Juan Islands, whereas it, the vine maple is a planted plant. It was something that was introduced here, but it does very well in a different environment. The vine maple needs more shade and moisture. Douglas maple, which occurs also east of the Cascades, is more adapted to drier and rockier sites. So depending on where you're placing these trees, those are two different habitat requirements, but they serve equal purposes. They're a, a short statured maple tree with lots of fall color and the flowers provide lots of um, food for pollinators. This is our Indian plum or oso berry. 
Um, this is a very early uh, blooming harbinger of spring. It actually starts blooming in February. I'll see what happens this year because of the coldness, but um, it has those lovely kind of pendulum whitish green flowers. And again, because it's an early bloomer, the bees, hummingbirds, they have something to feed on early in February, which is kind of nice. And one of my favorites is the red flowering currant, the Ribes sanguineum. Um, very attractive to hummingbirds, especially the rufous, which know when the red currants are starting to bloom, that's when they come back. They follow that and they follow the salmonberry and they just know it's like that time to come back up. Um, the currants are actually edible. Um, they are not quite as tasty to us as they are to many birds, but the flowers are, you know, very attractive to many kinds of pollinators. And they are very fast growing. Um, the, the picture in the bottom left of the slide there is one that I grew from a bare root from one of our many native plant sales, probably, I don't know, five, six years ago. And when they're happy, they grow really fast. And I just love them. I can't get enough of these. This is the red elderberry, the Sambucus racemosa. Unlike the blue elderberry, which we um, find east of the Cascades and can eat and use for medicinal purposes, these red berries are mildly toxic to humans unless they're cooked. But the hummingbirds and butterflies love the flowers. They love the floral nectar. It's a nice understory shrub. Um, and the blue elderberry also grows here too, but um, it, it's, all, it's been a planted plant here. It does pretty well here if you want, if you're interested in that one. Here's our service berry. Um, this is in the rose family. This is a very dominant species in a lot of, a lot of different parts of the island. It's a small tree or a shrub. Um, has a very extensive range. It's very hardy. It turns golden color in the fall. That's what you see a lot of our willows and service berry are what are, you see a lot of yellow in the fall. Provides a lot of food and habitat for butterflies and their larvae. Twinberry, Lomisera involucrata. This is in the honeysuckle family, but it's a shrub. It's not a vine. You have another native honeysuckle that climbs trees and is a vine. And I, I've been, I observed myself, I, I've observed often how much the hummingbirds love these tubular yellow flowers, and especially the cedar waxwings like the berries. The robins also eat those too. And this shrub is um, quite salt tolerant. So in some of those coastal habitat areas, you can get away with planting this. It grows well in other parts interior and, and forest woodlands and things, but it's a salt tolerant species, very hardy. And then we've got our um, thimbleberry and salmonberry, both of them are rubus species. And um, you can't go wrong with these. These are, I think they're, they're a good um, um, replacement for the blackberry, the Himalayan blackberry, because they create the thickets, they provide the flowers, they provide the berries, the berries are edible. Like I said earlier, um, the rufous hummingbirds know when the salmon berries start blooming, that's their time to start heading north and coming back to visit us. Jane, yes. there's a question about the service berries. Yes. Um, Cindy has one that's several years old, but is not flowering. And she's wondering what, why it is not flowering. Is it growing at all? Is it all by itself? Uh, um, I mean, is it thriving? Is the plant, does the plant look healthy otherwise? Okay, I, I she, she put that she's on her, phone. she's joining from her iPhone. So she, I'm okay. not, oh, she, that there are two and they're healthy. Huh. And she's had them for several years. I don't know. I, I um, maybe they're not getting enough sun depending on where they're planted. Mm -hmm. I don't know. She could email me. I could talk to her about it in an email. I mean, <laughs> you know, usually they're pretty, um, reliable if they get, you know, enough. I mean, they're not, they don't need a lot of water. Maybe it's too wet. Maybe it's not sunny enough. There could yeah, be she, she says that it could be not enough sun, although they look healthy. Yeah. Well, oh. I think that, I think then that might be something they might not be getting enough sun because okay. the plant themselves are growing, but in order to produce flowers, they need more resources to do that. And if they're not photosynthesizing enough because they're not getting enough sun, 
they're just going to put it into growth and not flowers. Flowers are very expensive to produce. So a healthy plant that's getting enough sugars in its system through photosynthesis will produce flowers. But if it doesn't get enough, they'll just produce leaves and, and stem growth, but not flowers. Because flowers are by far the most expensive thing resource-wise. She has them. one follow-up question. Do deer eat them? Yes. Yeah. Good question. Um, one of the, the things about native plants, especially the shrubs, is that pretty much the deer eat all of them because they co-evolved with them. That is what they browse on. Um, in my experience, there are the more native shrubs you have already around you means that they're not necessarily going to, you know, focus in on those two service berries that you planted in your yard because there's service berries around, that kind of thing. The more native plants that are around, the less yours will be browsed intensively. Um, but they're really, and I'll talk a little bit about that when I get to some herbaceous species, because there are some flowering plants that the deer don't eat that are mm -hmm. native. But I don't know, I mean, aside from maybe Oregon grape and Salal, although that's, there are exceptions to all of these, um, there are some shrubs that the deer don't eat, but service berry is one. They'll browse down below and you know, they have those kind of lollipop shapes above because that, they can't reach that high. So yeah, unfortunately, these native plants were around with our native fauna long before we were here. <laughs> So. Okay. R Randall has a more general question about raccoons. Maybe we can come to that at the end. Yeah, I think we can hold off for that. Okay. That's a that's a that's a big subject. We were talking about that over dinner last night. And got, <laughs> we got into some really interesting conversations. Okay. Great. Thank All you. Right, I'll move on. Um, evergreen huckleberry, again, this is a lovely um, it's a fruit producing shrub. I mean, we can eat those berries. Other animals love them too. Evergreen, it's a slow growing um, shrub, but it's a beautiful plant once you get it going and makes a very attractive hedge. And here's snowberry. This was the one I was talking about earlier with Dr. Richard Hebda. He thinks this is, gonna, this is the one that's gonna save us because it's non-stoppable once you have it. I mean, it depends on the space that you're trying to plant these things in. And there are a number of native plants when you talk about invasive, well, some of them are more aggressive and they will spread, they need room but it depends on where you're planting them. You might want to fill things in with snowberry, but snowberry is kind of a cool little plant because those little white berries persist all winter long and they provide a lot of winter food for birds and other animals. And the berry and the fruit, the flowers, which are the, the slide really makes them look a lot more conspicuous than I think they are, but the bees find them. The bees love the flowers. Um, and they they form nice little thickets, which give um, a lot of shelter to a lot of different animals. So I think it's a I think it's a winner. And then of course we have several roses, but the Nutka rose is the largest one we have, and it's the most fragrant of our wild roses. And I get I, you'll see those large rose hips. Those rose hips are very high in vitamin C, but they're also eaten by many birds. And the thickets that they form are very important shelter and nesting sites. And the flowers are fragrant and butterflies, bees, hummingbirds, you name it. They really love all of our roses, but I deliberately put in the Nutka rose because it's such a, a showy specimen. Here's one called silk tassel, Garia elliptica. Um, this is an evergreen shrub and I have this growing in my yard. And it's a slow growing plant, but I like it because it blooms in the winter. It is blooming now. And these lovely chain like flowers are what are providing something. Insects live in them. So a lot of the hummingbirds go after the insects and the flowers. And they also provide a nectar source for some of those bees that dare to even be out right now. But um, there, it's a beautiful, beautiful shrub and I um, highly recommend it. And it's quite drought tolerant once it's established. That's true for a lot of our native plants. There's no silver bullet when it comes to plant it and you don't have to do anything about it. You need to plant it in the right place where it'll be happy and you need to help it to become established if it needs help. Then once it's established, this, this plant 
this takes care of itself pretty well. Douglas Spirea, Spirea douglasii. This is um, this is kind of a forest edge and wetland edge species. This is one of those that it needs space. If you want to plant it, it's a beautiful plant. It and and it will spread. You need to give it room, but it has a lot of features that um, you know it blooms in in July, pinkish purple spikes, and it provides great um, thicket habitat cover. Waterfowl. It's often found around. Um, seasonal wet meadows and bogs and lake and pond margins, that kind of thing. But it does need space. It's not one that you put in your perennial garden around your house and, and think that it's going to not take over everything. It will outcompete with a lot of things. Shrubby sink foil, Dasiphora fruticosa. Um, the picture up in the right corner is my yard, and I have lots of these growing. And you'll see them growing with <clears throat> some irises and lavender. Um, it is a deer resistant plant, at least in my yard. So I can say attest to that. And um, it blooms in early summer and persists through late fall. So it provides a lot of um, nectar for bees and other pollinators. And it's also quite drought tolerant once it's established. Most of the plants around the perimeter of my deck do not get irrigation, except during a really heavy hot drought period, otherwise they just do it on their own. Also, you can also train it to be a nice decorative hedge you can see down below. Pacific nine bark, um, this is a four season charmer. I love this plant, I grow this at my house too. So you've got your beautiful puffy white ball-like flowers and the Physocarpus capitatus. Capitatus refers to the shape of the flower and it has glossy maple-like leaves in the spring, which are really pretty. Um, I don't have a picture of the red fruits, but it, it produces red fruits with these little yellow seeds in the summer. The leaves turn a rosy brown color in the fall. The bark has this bronze-colored shedding bark in, that is especially nice-looking in winter when everything else dies back. Um, it's a very versatile plant, so it, it's like sun or shade, wet to dry good for a hedgerow, good for a specimen plant, then also can provide lots of shelter for birds and the butterflies like the flowers and, um, and the foliage as well. Salal, this is a, I, in my opinion, it's a very underestimated and sometimes maligned, excellent shrub and ground cover. And it's everywhere. So <laughs> you could have a love-hate relationship like some of us do, but um, it actually grows taller when it's grown in the shade and it will form dense thickets. And once you've established it, it can be somewhat challenging to remove. And it's also very difficult to dig up and transplant. But when it, where it is and where it's happy, it provides a lot of good resources for um, animals and insects. So, you know, I, I have it in a lot of different places. It's kind of coming up on its own in parts of my garden. I keep an eye on it, I trim it back, but it has its useful place. Mock orange, Philadelphus louisii. This is a shrub that is found um, east of the Cascades, but it can grow here. And it's a lovely, deciduous, fragrant shrub. Um, it does smell a lot like orange blossoms. It's beautiful. And it requires minimal attention once it's mature. In my experience, I've planted these a lot through our native plant sale. They need a little bit of coaxing. They, they're small when they start. And once they those roots really get accustomed to where they are, it takes off and it grows really nicely. Um, chickadees, juncos, and flickers love to eat the seeds and several butterfly species feed on the floral nectar. So in addition to it pleasing to our um, olfactory senses, it's also a very good plant for wildlife. Buffalo berry, Shepherdia canadensis. This is one that not everybody really knows about. And we've often sold it at our plant sale. Um, it's a very um, beautiful shrub. You'll often find it in the understory of those lowland and coniferous forests. Beautiful red berries. The leaves have like a silvery gray underside that's kind of fuzzy. And if you look really closely, <clears throat> if you ever see them in the wild, they have little rust colored dots along the mid, mid vein of the leaf. Kind of an interesting plant. Um, it's a nitrogen fixer. So it also adds nitrogen to the soil. 
So it makes it a good choice for areas that you're trying to beef up with some nitrogen, like alders do, alders are nitrogen fixers. Um, and I, I think this is an underestimated plant. I'd like to see more of it here. It does occur here naturally, and um, birds love the fruits, and um, it's, a good, it's a good hardy plant to have, especially in our drier, hotter conditions. American Cranberry Viburnum, Opulus Americanum. So this is a semi-evergreen. It, it's somewhat deciduous, but sometimes the leaves persist for a long period of time throughout the fall and winter. And in the fall, they turn this bright red and they're really beautiful. And the flowers, they're kind of a lace, almost like a hydrangea type of flower. Um, they attract a variety of, of pollinators throughout the summer, May through July. And this is a plant that those red berries are also really important food sources for a lot of our um, native fauna. I wanted to just mention there's a number of plants you'll, you'll probably be aware of that have these really attractive red berries. And the ones that often become problems are the invasive ones like English holly or English hawthorn. Those are two that come to mind. Beautiful red berries, they're very attractive. And then the birds take off with them and wherever they decide to poop them out, those become places where these plants grow and that's why they spread, similar to like Himalayan blackberries, same kind of thing. But I just, you know, I, I think this is a good example of an American, this, you're not gonna find this growing in the wild even though the birds are, are eating these berries because it's just not as aggressive a plant. So it's not likely to become invasive, even though it's a beautiful red berry plant that birds will like to go after. Red stem Ceanothus, Ceanothus sanguineus. Again, that name sanguineus refers to blood. So it's, it's talking about the red color of the stems, which are not really apparent in any of these pictures, but um, this is a very, Ceanothus are, well, we do have a Ceanothus that a lot of people plant and it's from California, California lilac Ceanothus, I don't remember the species, but it's also, you know, in that genus. But these, this is one of our three native Ceanothus and they are, all Ceanothus flowers are pollinated by bees. Bees really love them. And they are also larval hosts for a lot of different um, butterflies. This particular one, which is our native, is a specific host for the pale swallowtail. And the pale swallowtail larvae really only like to feed on the, the native Ceanothus because it's our native butterfly. So it's a really good way to support butterflies and feed birds and their chicks at the same time because you've got your larvae um, system going there. We've got our two different Oregon grapes, the Mahonias, the Nervosa is the low and the Aquifolium is the tall. Both of them flower in the spring. So those yellow flowers are an early flowering, early nectar source for a lot of pollinators. And the bluish berries are edible for us and birds and other animals. And they tend to be deer resistant because they're kind of a holly-like leaf. They're a little tough, they're kind of spiny, and um, they're a good one to have in your garden. Kinnikinnik is a shrub, actually. It's a woody ground cover. It's a low growing shrub. And um, it's sort of like manzanita, which I know you have here on Orcas up on Mount Constitution. I always love going up and seeing that grove of manzanita because you don't find it growing here anywhere else in the islands. Um, but this is a very versatile, evergreen, hardy plant. Those pinkish white little bell shaped flowers are really important nectar sources for a lot of different kinds of bees. And the red berries are also good um, foraging for other animals. Okay, Oregon iris and Douglas iris. These are two of our native irises. And you may be aware that irises are deer tolerant. In my yard, they are definitely deer tolerant. All my bearded iris are deer tolerant, deer, deer resistant, so the deer don't bother them. But these two are the natives that I also plant in my yard and they are beautiful and um, the deer don't eat them either. So I highly recommend them. And these are also evergreen. Douglas iris tends to have a big bushy clump-like form that you can you have to divide after several years, but you can give them away, you can plant them somewhere else 
and they do just fine. And they're very drought tolerant and I really enjoy them in my garden. Okay, and even though it looks like we'll never see this, you know that spring is going to be coming. And that's what one of the main, the flowering perennials that we see in the spring are our main attraction around the islands in the spring, of course. And here we go with lots and lots of beautiful flowering perennials. And these are all as beautiful as they are useful in our gardens. They provide nectar and food and forage for lots of different species. So, um, you know, grow as many of these as you can. My own experience with camas, and I've been experimenting with camas, because, you know, when you see patches of camas, the larger ones, for some reason, I never see them getting heavily browsed by deer. But when I planted my first, I don't know, maybe 50 bulbs in my yard, most of them all got eaten when they bloomed. And I thought, well, how does that work in nature? Like, why are they only coming to my house? Well, I think it's a quantity thing. So the more that I can plant, the less they will die back because the deer will only browse so much and then they move on. They're unlike, unlike sheep that just mow everything down. Deer will just browse and move, browse and move. They pick and, and move on. And so my goal is to just keep planting camas bulbs. And over the years, it's becoming quite successful and they are surviving. So, um, and these plants, most of these plants are also very um, attractive in our gardens as well as in pots, containers. They, they are very adaptable. I love to see them, you know, in the meadows and the prairies, but also in gardens. And ferns, my gosh, we've had so many different kinds of ferns. These are just a few of the ferns that we have. Many of these are winter, decidu uh, winter deciduous, but things like the deer fern and the sword fern, they stick around all year round. Licorice fern sometimes, although with this cold weather, they are shriveling up, but they'll come back. Um, many of these are somewhat deer resistant. I'd say I find my, my sword ferns are getting munched once in a while when there isn't a whole lot of else, other things for the deer to eat. But they all provide lots of texture and color and stature in the garden. And they also provide cover and nesting materials for birds and other animals. So the next few slides, I'm just gonna go through them to show you some examples of how these plants can be incorporated into your garden. These are, this one is courtesy of Steve Schramm, formerly of Island Garden Design Company. You know, a mix of ferns and rhododendrons and all in a little sitting area. I think there's, these are just really lovely. Um, here you have things like bleeding heart and over to the right is oxalis, um, low, beautiful shade loving ground covers. Um, you know, we don't see them here occurring naturally, but they're very lovely plants to bring into your garden. Um, this is the fringe cup down below the um, light lamp post and you can see the, the sword ferns with their curly new fiddlehead fronds coming out. And, um, you know, a backdrop of trees and things that are already there and just in enjoying and appreciating the, the salau and other things that, um, um, evergreen huckleberry, things that may already be there. You can even turn those into a nice little sanctuary. Oregon grape is another Lovely one to add. And this is the uh, false lily of the valley along with a bunch of deer fern and sword fern, thimbleberry off to the left. Um, I think the false lily of the valley and the ferns were probably planted amidst the other um, shrubs and things that were already there. Okay. Um, there are a number of resources that you can go to to determine which plants to choose. Two that I really like, one is through the Xerxes Society. If you go online to Xerxes, X-E-R-C-E-S. And this is um, pollinator.org. And um, I think I might have, let's see, yeah, here it is. So this is showing, um, you, you can go to your particular province or region. So this is Pacific Lowland Mixed Forest Province. And it talks about the plants and when they flower and which pollinators they that like to visit them. So here's a good way to choose, you know, what kind of plants 
do you already have? And what are, what food are they doing for your pollinators and other wildlife? And what kind of plants might you want to add? And there's pages and pages of this, how to select plants specifically for pollinators. Um, I find this to be a very useful resource. And then what I like to do is go to one of my many books, which um, I will also provide. Um, I can send you in the future. I'll send you an, um, after this is done a list of those. But I also go back to that Burke Herbarium um, collection, image collection site. If you really want to see some lovely photographs of a plant. So, you know, let's say you want to look up um, the, the vaccinium or the huckleberry, vaccinium, um, the common name is huckleberry. Go to the image collection, browse on vaccinium, click on it. It'll give you the range, where it's found, what its characteristics are, whether it's native or not, which is a good thing to figure out. And, and then lots and lots and lots of photos. So you can really get a sense of what this plant might look like and where it might look good in your garden. And the other thing is to look at what's already growing around you and try to complement that or supplement that. I wanna put in a plug for um, another source of native plants, which is our annual native plant sale. And it is going online at 8 a.m. the morning of January 27th this year. And um, Supplies are limited. Some things sell out quickly, as you may have noticed last year. I think within the first few hours, a lot of things had sold out. That's a really good problem to have when you're on the Native Plant Sale Committee because in years past, we've had lots of plants left over and we didn't know what to do with them all. So we like it when we sell out, but we really want to make our customers happy. So give us feedback if you can, because we're kind of struggling with that. But we have a number of really lovely plants, some of which I've already talked about. Um, the buffalo berry, the red currant, the sword fern, kinikinik, twin berry, Douglas spirea, um, mock orange, and American cranberry are things I've already spoken about. I showed you a picture of the oxalis. That's a new one we're going to be selling this year. It's a little shade-loving brown cover. And the paper birch, Pacific rhododendron, and black cottonwood are also um, plants that are included in the sale. So please um, check it out, and I, I hope that it helps you to decide on some plants for your garden. Okay, so I've been reading that having at least 70% native plants in our gardens is a good way to provide for a thriving and surviving wildlife and insect populations. So it's always, you know, you don't have to go all native. You can do a mix of natives, but the more natives you put in there, the more you're going to support native Plant, native animals and insects. And I'm trying to achieve this in my own garden. Um, so here's an example. You've got the cyclamen down at the bottom, along with the licorice fern, trillium, oxalis, and other ferns and things. So it's a beautiful mix of plants that are in the right place. They enjoy the same kinds of habitats and they're pleasing to the eye. So I'm striving to achieve this in my own garden. These are pictures at the top of what my backyard looks like. So I have, it's surrounded by trees and shrubs, which supports a lot of birds. I have so many birds in my yard, it's, in, it's incredible. And um, in the summer, those mossy balds turn kind of brownish, but in the winter, this time of year, when they're not under snow, they look kind of green and lush. And the two slides at the bottom are what I want to plant there. So imagine a field full of plectritis and sedum and red paintbrush and camas and death camas. You'll see that in the bottom. And the other little flower, the little yellowy flower in that bottom right is um, desert parsley or the lamatium. So those are native plants too. And the other thing that I've added, um, which I don't have slides of, is goldenrod and Douglas Aster, because those both bloom later in the fall and persist through the fall. So it's a nectar source for bees. And if you've ever grown any of those, give them some space because they love to take up space. They're very, very hardy. So in summary, whether you choose to go all native or a mix of native and non-invasive, non-native plants, when you bring these plants into your cultivated garden, both you and the fauna that visit and rely on them will receive many benefits. 
And no matter the goal, gardeners can enjoy lower maintenance plants, those that draw in butterflies, hummingbirds, and other pollinators, and those that require less frequent watering. Native plants are beautiful and offer many of these desirable attributes. I encourage you to take the time to observe what you already have around you, seek out information to choose additional plants, and then enjoy creating more wildlife and habitat friendly gardens. Thank you. Jane. Applause, please, my, my <laughs> audience of two. Thank you. Well, well, there are lots of us out here. <laughs> yes, I know. I know you're out there. I should oh. turn to gallery so I can see all your faces. Yeah. So I just oh. want to men make a mention of this. All of these pictures in this last slide are actually from my house, my garden, my yard. And um, given our conversation last night at dinner, I don't know if you noticed that beautiful little spotted fawn among well, actually it's among the Canada thistle and pasture grasses in our meadow. We had to talk about um, deer and, you know, I do have a love-hate relationship with deer, but these little fawns, you know, they have to have a place to be born and our meadow is the perfect place for that. And so one of the things I forgot to say too about the low maintenance is I've been reading a lot and I think Doug Tallamy talked me into this too, that you don't have to deadhead and you don't have to mow everything down and especially in winter, if you leave those old stalks that um, insects love to burrow in them and they overwinter and they provide shelter and then come spring when things start growing again, that's the time to tidy it up. So to me, that's, that's a blessing because I don't have to do a whole lot of work at the end of the bloom period. And I know that I'm providing something to wildlife. And then also, if you look at the bottom corner, you might notice that there's a fox under the bird feeder and a fox off to the right. And then there's a little doe beyond the fox. So, um, and I don't know if you could see my bird bath, but that's my yard. I mean, I, I love it. Um, I know the foxes are introduced species and um, I know they go after my voles and, you know, they have a place now too. They're not gonna go any, go away. And maybe they'll keep the bunnies out. I don't know, I'm hoping. But anyway, this is my yard and I, I'm, I'm sharing my goals with you and I hope you will do the same with your own gardens. So questions, please. Yeah. Okay, I'm gonna go, I'm aware that you need to be on the road in, in four minutes. So right. I, I right. am, I'm going to suggest we, that- We can give it 10, let's give it 10. Oh, okay. I mean, well, I, yeah, let's do 10. Okay, so then Randall asked, will all these berry plants attract raccoons? And yes. so that, that's well, right. you know, that's an interesting question. Raccoons are very omnivorous. They actually are very much adapted to what, what we as humans provide. I find the raccoons go after my bird seed in the bird feeder way more than they go after any of my plants. So I don't know. I think, um, yes, the answer probably is that they have adapted to eat a lot of the berries and things, but I know, I don't think it becomes a problem. I don't think they attract as much as, um, you know, leaving your pet food outside or bird seed on the ground, that kind of thing. And then Alexander asks, is evergreen huckleberry less valuable to wildlife if grown in shade? And their goal is to have a hedge that grows quickly. And they've read that that would be more likely to happen in shade. Um, well, if they are producing, well, they produce cover, whether they're growing in shade or sun. If they produce berries, they're producing food. And if they're getting enough part sun, even in a shady area, they will flower. So yeah, I think they'd be as beneficial. Yeah. Okay. And then um, someone asks, is it better to plant a wide variety of plants to encourage diversity or to focus on a few and plant more of them? It depends on the number and the amount of space you have, but it's always a good idea to plant more of uh, the same kind of thing, either in like a cluster and move on and, you know, so more, more species, but not like a single plant of everything, if, if you know what I mean. The diversity is important, but you need to have, you know, more than one plant of each thing. So if you don't have a lot of space, 
choose, say, three plants that you can plant several of them. Because again, you know, especially for those specialist um, insect pollinators, if they, if they, they're not going to find a single plant of anything that's in, in flower. They're going to find something that's more of a contiguous grouping. Does that make sense? That makes a lot of sense. They, okay. they don't want to spend time going to a whole bunch of grocery stores if they can go to one. Right, right. Um, and then this is, uh, um, Alexandria is as Alexandra, I'm sorry, is asking, would you support changing the noxious weed laws? And the, to change would be to require that removed invasives be replaced with native plants and that herbicides be banned from the options of removal. <laughs> we found that mass removal of scotch broom that was previously buzzing with bees and a place for deer to hide left nothing at all for wildlife. Oh, yeah, that's that's a tricky one. Um, I agree. I think it's unfortunate that when noxious weeds have taken over and displaced all of the native vegetation, that when they are removed, it leaves little left. But that kind of eradication of large areas need to be followed up with restoration, replanting with native plants so that it's not left as just a barren area where more weeds can grow. Um, yeah, I, you know, personally, I, if we would only have gotten onto some of these invasive species earlier, we wouldn't have quite the, the depth of the problem now. Um, I think it's still a good idea to get rid of the invasive species. And yes, they do support a number of animals and insects, but a native restoration would also support those kinds of animals and insects. So to be on the safe side, a lot of times these rest, these um, eradication efforts don't have the money to follow up with restoration. And that's, that's really short sighted because um, it doesn't, it, it leaves very little left. So um, yeah, it's a tricky one. Yeah. There are lots of invasive species that do provide for lots of insects and other animals. And um, I just like to look at better alternatives that are native or less invasive. Um, just really quickly, I think last question, and this is one that I know that a lot of people have. When you plant lavender, you see a lot of bees. And is there any recommendation, should we be replacing those? No, I don't think so. You know, if you go back to that little, that kind of quasi rule 70% in native, that it means you can plant 30% of anything you want. And lavender, they attract a lot of bees. They're deer resistant in my yard. I always have to say that because that's not necessarily true in everybody's place. But um, yeah, I like lavender. I mean, I grow lavender. I grow hot lip salvia. I grow rosemary. None of um, all of those, the deer don't seem to bother too much. And they attract lots and lots and lots of bees. And I love that. So I would not get rid of your lavender. But if you have space, bring in some native plants too to supplement that, to complement those. 